Good morning. How are we doing? All right. Okay. We're tired, I guess. How are we doing? All right. We really miss Maggie in here. She's like the hype beast of this room. You guys that know Maggie know that to be true, and she's going to be embarrassed when she hears this on the recording. Um, but my name is Ernie. I'm the pastor here. Welcome to Mercy Hill Church. It is great to be with you on Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you dads. Hope you got you, yeah? We can clap for dads. I hope that if you were a dad that you got to sleep in just a little bit this morning and got some nice hugs from your kids. They told you happy Father's Day, maybe got you some food, some breakfast, whatever. But I hope you've had a good experience till then. And if you have dads, I hope you've sent a message to your father. It says, I love you. Something was heartfelt that you said, hey, thank you for being here. Because to be honest, when we talk about fathers in our culture, it would not be wrong to say this. It would not be wrong to say that the role of father is incredibly diminished in our society, that our culture devalues masculinity, manhood, fatherhood, and we can see it in every show that we ever watch. In every show that you ever watch, the husband is a bumbling idiot. Like at best, like he's a lovable fool, you know, but he's not to be trusted with even the most simplest of tasks because he will mess it up and he's just got this, he's got this beer gut, he's just a buffoon. And every single one of them, he's the guy that we love to laugh at that is foolish. But father's in the room. Hey, Seth, do you mind doing doing me a favor? Do you mind hitting that, turning off that that AC over there? Thanks. It's kind of hard to hear with all the the sound going on. Yeah, it's right there. Uh, No, 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 no. Keep going. Other side of the post. Right there. Yeah, hit that right there. All right. Sorry, guys. It was going to get real loud for you guys. This HVAC is, is pretty loud. But dads, you know that that's not true. You know that's not the reality of who you are. We know that you work yourself to death on behalf of those that you, that you love. We know that you have sleepless nights, and we know that you even have to, isn't that so much better? We know that you don't have to battle. We know that you have to even battle the thoughts in your mind that you fight over and over and over again. The moments that you feel inadequate, the moments that you spent up just praying and thinking about your family, the lies that you have to wrestle with that you're not good enough or you haven't done well enough or that you're missing the target and that you're totally failing your family over and over and over and over again. That you bear a weight that no one else bears and that no one else can understand. We know that you are overburdened, underappreciated, overscrutinized, and told that your role does not matter. Your role really matters. It matters so much that we can see statistic after statistic after statistic that prove that a father in the home is one of the most important things that could happen. I'm going to list out some statistics to us that you won't hear society talk about, but are totally true. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children with behavior disorders are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent chemical abuse patients and drug treatment centers are from fatherless homes. 85% of all youth in prison are from fatherless homes. And it's not just how it affects their behavior you also have an opportunity to affect their spiritual life because here's a crazy fact. If a father lives in a home and he doesn't go to church, but the wife does, the kids after, it says that one child in 50 will become a worshiper of Jesus when they grow up. 2%. But the flip side of that is this. If a father does go to church and the wife doesn't, 66% of those kids will grow up loving Jesus. From 2% to 66%. Dads, it really matters how you pursue Christ in your family. I know society tells you that raising kids is a mom's job or you don't have much to do with it, but it is totally untrue. Now, if both parents are in the home and going to the church, then that number goes up to 75%. The absence of a father is a devastating thing on a family's life. 
fact, some of you already know that because there's some, you had a father, but he's not with you this Father's Day. And that's extremely, this day is an extremely painful moment for you because there's someone you would call or that you would reach out to that's not there. Some of you, you've never had that father. He's always been absent. And so a day like this reminds you of a dad that you've never had. And it can be very difficult for you. I want you to know this. That even if you've never had a father, you have a heavenly father that cares about you. And you have a community, a church that wants to draw around you. And they want to fill in the gap and walk alongside you. And whether it's grief, pain, difficulty, help, there are godly men in this church, young men, that you can look up to as a father figure. Connect yourself to them and follow their example. It will do well for you. But dads, while you're not honored or held in high esteem esteem in our society, you're honored here. And we're thankful for you. And we need you to display godly manhood and leadership that God has placed upon your life for the growth of our church and the spurring on of our church and the encouraging and growing of our body, both towards Christ and with Christ. So I'd like to take a minute and just pray for the dads. Can we do that? As we open up the word of God, let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much for the men that are fighting the good fight, the men that are leading their families and loving the Lord and, and, and protecting their wives and, and, and seeking the good of those around them, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them. I pray that you would remove the guilt of their failures, the shame of their, their, their steps that they've just, they've just fallen short of, Lord, that you, they would know that your grace and mercy is new today for them. And they would walk in the likeness of your voice and not the lies they hear regularly in their heart and mind. God, I pray that you would raise up amongst all these young faces I see, young men that love the Lord, that love their families, that put you first in their life and create a different kind of family, Lord, where the divorce rate isn't 50%. Where the Christian family, where a Christian family would look different and the families that don't know Christ because of their obedience and love to you and sacrificial leadership of their family. It is needed. And so, Lord, may we draw near to you and may you transform us to be the men that we're meant to be. Thank you for the fathers and the fathers that will be. We love you, Jesus, and we praise you. Amen. All right, thank you all for doing that. Hey, we're going to get into John 4 real quick, and we're going to do it a little bit different than what I've done before. Uh, we're going to read through the whole thing, and I'm going to give some commentary afterwards, and then we're going to talk about kind of four points that I see in this passage uh, that could really have an impact in all of our lives, four observations that I think are really important. So there's a lot of scripture to get into, and I had a really long introduction, so let's just dive right into it right now, okay? Verse 1, he says, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making, making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea, departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to town, a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, weary as he, had, as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was the sixth hour, okay? The sixth hour means it's about noon, okay? I'm going to give a little context here. When it says six hours, it's not like 6 a.m. It's the sixth hour of sunlight. So it's around noon. Jesus comes, and he's walking from where? Judea to Galilee, all right? And I have a little map that's going to help us understand that. Like, why is this in the story besides letting us chart along with where he's going? Why does this matter? Because something really big is going to happen in the story, but we need to understand the context of it. So if you see that kind of orange area down there, that's Judah, Judea. That's where Jesus is ministering to, and he wants to go to Galilee which is the green area. The yellow area, because you may not be able to read it in the back, that's Samaria. So if you look at this map, you're like, well, yeah, that's obvious he's going to pass through Samaria. Like, obviously he's going to go there. Why, why, why? And then there's Sychar right there. Like, why not just list out all of the other towns he's going to walk through? Why are you listing out this single one? Well, there's something you have to understand is that Samaria and the rest of Israel did not get along. In fact, if we're talking about like 
the hierarchy ranking, like Judea, the people of Judea feel really good about themselves, right? All right. Galilee, not so much. That's like Michigan, okay? All right. Ohio would be Judea, okay? Michigan, like, we don't like those people up there, right? Uh, in Samaria, though, those, that'd be like Canada, okay? Who cares about them? Okay, come to, I'm, just, I'm just joking. But they definitely didn't like Samaritans. And why did they not like Samaritans? Well, because in the history of Israel, all right, in the history of Israel, around 700 B.C., the, before that, the kingdom split into two. There was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And the Assyrians came in 722, and they conquered the northern kingdom. And Samaria was part of that. And when they conquered the northern kingdom, what they did is they, they took half of the population and brought it to Assyria. And then they brought another foreign population and put it in Samaria and caused them to intermarry with these people. The goal for the Assyrians was to wipe out the indigenous culture of that place that would all assimilate into this hodgepodge of something that just like everything and would just look like Assyria. Well, after the Assyrians conquered them, they were conquered by the Babylonians. The Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom as well, which was Judea. And then uh, at some point, all right, Nehemiah makes a cry out to the to Babylonian king, like, hey, can I go back to, set, to raise the walls of Israel? And, he, and the king grants him this wish. And as he goes back, he goes into the area. And, the, and guess what? He, they, the Jews start coming back from exile to Israel, and they find these people that would later be called the Samaritans who had intermarried who began worshiping pagan gods along with, along with the God of Yahweh, and they began looking at them as traitors to their own country. Like, how could you sleep with the bad guys? How could you have families with the bad guys? How could you, how could you adopt their gods? And so there's all this hatred towards Samaritans. In fact, the Samaritans, when Nehemiah came back, they opposed him building the walls. So they're like enemies. They're turncoats in some ways to the Israelites. And, 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 and they even did even worse things where they were the kind of people, they raised up another place to worship other than Jerusalem. They put it on this mount, and they said, and they built this temple, and guess what? They dedicated the temple to Zeus. And it would take 300 years for a, a Judea leader to come and tear down that temple and destroy it, but yet the Samaritans would continue to worship on that hill. They would only consider the first five books, the Pentateuch, as canonized scripture, and the rest of it, they were opposed to it. So you have these two groups that really hate one another. So much so that Judean, specifically Judean religious leaders, if they were going to go to Galilee, they would go to the east. See that little line that's in the middle? That's the Jordan River. And they would walk along the east side and then cut over to the west to get to where they wanted to go. So much so that the Jewish people hate the Samaritans so much, they said they were unclean, Samar like completely unclean. Like to be in contact or touch them would be wrong. It would make you unclean. Pharisees would pray that none of the Samaritans would rise in the resurrection. There's just deep hatred, bigotry, and just division between these two groups. And so for Jesus to walk through as a religious teacher, as a Jewish religious teacher, to go through Samaria, that is a radical thing. But we're going to see why he does that because it's pretty cool what he's going to do. So look at verse 7. He says, and a woman from Samaria came to draw water. It's the middle of the day. And Jesus says to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. In a sense, what this woman is saying, she's kind of throwing a zinger, like a, a snarky remark. Like, this woman's like, hey, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan. Like, why are you talking to me? Oh, okay, I guess you only talk to me when you need something from me because your people have treated me so badly. She wants to get into a, converse, a conflict about, like, her dealings as a Samaritan and then as a Jew. Like, she wants to jump into this, like, that's the group we hate, this group hates us. Let's jump into that conversation. L guys, let me tell you something real quick. Whenever you bump into people that are hurting, they're typically hostile. And what Jesus is going to do here is he's not going to jump into the political conversation that would be so easy, but he's going to jump into the heart of the conversation to see transformation in this woman's life. See, in verse 10, Jesus answers her and says, if you knew the gift of God, who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you have asked him, 
and he would have given you living water. Guys, y'all remember the story of Nicodemus from two weeks ago? Were you here for that? What was Jesus coming to give? Was it judgment? No, it was life. And here Jesus is cutting through the political conversation, not taking the bait, not wanting to enter in to a surface-level conversation with this woman, but to speak to the heart issue that's in her life. Look how she responds. Then the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? She's not getting it. She's thinking on the wrong plane. She's thinking just like Nicodemus was when Jesus says you had to be born again. She's thinking through the natural way of thinking through things. But God, Jesus is not speaking to her about a natural thing, but a supernatural thing because he's supernatural. She continues, said, are you greater than our, our father Jacob? He, he gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. She's essentially being like, do you think you're better than us? you think you can build a better well? You think this well is the good, like, you're well, like, Jacob gave us this well. You're better than Jacob? And again, Jesus responds straight to the heart of the matter and says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whomever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Look how she responds. Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and have to come here to draw water. Jesus is saying, you hear what Jesus is saying to her? We think your needs are met by this well. What I have to give you will overflow in your life and to others. And we're going to see as she, he gives her this living water, him, himself, how it overflows into other people. And that is a natural response that should happen. But again, she is here, and she's still not getting it. And she's being snarky to God. She doesn't realize it. Could you imagine you're, like, snarky to this person, and you all of a sudden find out they're going to go, oh, my goodness. But Jesus is about to have a moment that's going to wake her up. It's going to expose her in the same way that he exposed Nicodemus. And it's both for their good. What does Jesus say to her? Go and call your husband and come here. Woman's like, I don't have a husband. He's like, I know. You have five. You've had five. And the person we're with right now, that's not your husband. All of a sudden, he's not just a Jew. She started saying, hey, I perceive that you're a prophet. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Should we worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem? Jesus just pointed to the biggest, most exposed hurt in her life. And she's just trying to keep God at a distance. I can't help but wonder how many of you has the Holy Spirit just been tapping on this thing in your heart and your mind. And you just want to get caught up in Facebook battles or Instagram arguments or infuriated by whatever you saw in the news or whatever's going on in your life. But there's all this distraction that you're just trying to keep the Holy Spirit at bay because it doesn't touch that thing because it really hurts when it gets touched. Could you imagine the pain, the shame that this woman has experienced in her life? And here God has just pointed right to it. And he says, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what's going on in your heart, your heart because I'm the answer to the problems that you have. I'm the one that can deal with it. Jesus then says to her woman, which he's not being rude or frustrated. This is actually just a respectful way to address a person in that culture. Believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He says you, and he says you, he means the Samaritans. Worship what you do not know. Why don't they know it? Because they only have the first five books of the Old Testament. He says, we, meaning the Jews, worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, 
and it is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. I'm going to park it here for a minute. Jesus is telling her, there's going to be a day where, ge- where the geography of a temple is not going to matter. There's going to be a day where it doesn't matter if you're Samaritan or Jew. In fact, Paul would expound on this and say there's going to be a day where it doesn't matter Greek, Gentile, Samaritan, Jew. It won't, male, female, it won't matter. Because the place that worship of God is going to take place is not going to be in a location, but in a person's heart. And it's not going to be about where you go, but it's going to be about your posture when you worship. You know, as Jesus said, those who worship in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? When he says worship and in spirit, what Jesus is saying is those that worship God sincerely. Sincerely. From a heart level that leaves their lips. Guys, God is not impressed with the charade that you do with your lips that isn't happening in your heart. He's not excited about you proclaiming something that is true but not living it out in your life. He finds no, nothing pleasing in that whatsoever. In fact, the Old Testament is filled with Jesus, like with God telling his people to stop banging claims and hitting drums and doing this stuff because it wasn't sincere worship. What does it mean to worship in truth? Is that we would actually worship God for who he actually is. So you could find a lot of churches that sound really good and they sing a lot of songs that are centered around you and what God can do for you. But true worship is worshiping God for who he is, from who we, how we truly feel about him. That true worship is about worship that is about God, for God, centered on God, not self. See, what Jesus is saying, he goes, it doesn't matter if you're going to be a Samaritan or Jew at this moment. It's not going to matter because I'm going to do something new. I'm going to place the Holy Spirit within people. And they're going to be transformed from the inside out. And they're going to worship because their hearts are going to cry out to God. Now, here's where the tenor changes for the woman. Verse 25. It says, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. I believe this is her way of saying, I think you're him. Are you him? Are you the guy? Are you the one? And look at Jesus' words. I who speak to you am he. This is like the big reveal in John. Because we've seen these signs. We've seen these things that have been said about him. We see these actions that he's done, what others have said. And now, finally, Jesus has just said it. I am the Messiah. And look who he says it to an outcast of an outcast. He says it to a person who is despised by the Jews and even despised by her own people. Go, she's out there getting water at noon because she doesn't want to go in the early hours because she's going to be harassed by the women that she lives around. She's not only rejected by the Jewish people, she's rejected by her own people in her own town. Friends, if you're sitting in a chair in this room and, and you are watching online or wherever you are and you think you're the last person that God will want you to be a part of his family, this is a very encouraging text to you. This is a very encouraging moment because the God of the universe just revealed himself, not to the proud, the powerful, the religious, but to the spiritually broken, those who are, who are obstinate to the Lord, those who reject his people and reject him, those who have little worth, in the world, the God of the universe just revealed himself to a Samaritan woman who has had five husbands and now is going to send her out to be his representative to her hometown. 
See, if you're sitting in this room, you're saying, okay, maybe I could be a part of God's family, but I could never represent God because of my past. Look at what God is doing right here. He's saying, listen, you may be a total mess in the world's eye. In fact, in God's eye, you are a complete mess. But God says, hey, I can work with that because my mercy, my grace, my spirit, my power, my work is so perfect, I can completely transform and change you. And it doesn't matter who you are because I can still use you. Amen? Do we like that? Wake up here, guys. We're looking at the word of God this morning. I'm not reading a math book up here. This is an amazing, beautiful picture we see here. And see, right at this moment, these disciples come back. Look at verse 37. They come back, and they marvel that he's actually talking to this woman. But they won't say anything because they're afraid, and this woman leaves. And what does she leave? She leaves behind the water jar. Just make a note of that. The thing that she came with, she left it. The agenda that she had today was over with. We're going to come back to that in a minute. But she goes into the town, and what does she say in verse 29? Come see a man who told me all that I have ever did. Can, can this be the Christ? And they went out from the town, and were coming to him. Do You see how God just took a mission field and turned her into a missionary? That is the story of every Christian in this room. If you think you're better than the Samaritan woman, then you don't have a correct view of yourself. You may not have been divorced five times, but your sin to God is just as ugly as that is to culture. You are just as broken and spiritually bankrupt. See, God's plan is to take a mission field and turn it into a missionary. She needed the mercy of God, and she has the mercy of God now. Now she's going to be one that's going to tell other people about the mercy of God. As this amazing thing happens, look at the disciples. In 31, they say, they, they begin to urge him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? They're like, hey, let's eat some food. Let's get out of here. Let's not spend any more time in Samaria. I'm glad that woman left. That wasn't a good picture for us. Like, I don't know what you were doing there. And then when they're like, wait, so let's eat, let's get out. And he's like, I'm not, I have food that you don't know about. It's like, somebody else feed him? Jesus then explains it to him. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his works. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit from the, for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I send you, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Now it jumps back into the story of the woman in 39. Let's read this quickly, and I got some observations for us. He says, He says, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And he told that he told me all that I had ever did. So when the Samaritans come to him, they ask, this is Jesus, to, sit, to stay with them. And he stays for two days. And the disciples like, let's get out of town. He's like, no, let's stick here for a while. And many more believed of his word. And they said to the woman, is it no longer because of you or what you said that we believe? For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Guys, what a beautiful story. How amazing is that, amen? How incredible is that? How amazing to see Jesus reveal himself to the most lowly he could find as his first revelation, verbal speaking of who he is. How amazing it is to see the redemption in this woman's life as she overflows with the joy of God. How amazing is it to see how God uses her in a town to see transformation just completely happen. And here's the crazy thing about this. This is the most amazing thing about this story for me. All these people came to faith, but Jesus wasn't doing a bunch of miracles. We don't need that photo yet. Thanks for being on the top of it, though. All of these people came to faith, but Jesus didn't perform one miracle in Samaria. All he did was tell the woman her history. That was the only miracle he did. He would say, I completely know you. 
It was just from coming out of her mouth and then seeking and speaking to him. Guys, this is something as a pastor I pray to happen in Cincinnati. That God would reveal himself maybe to one of you in this room and you would begin a revival in the cities and the campuses and the campuses in the city and the city and the communities and neighborhoods and townships that we have here, that we begin to see people turn back to God because they've just heard and been transformed by what they've heard. That God would use someone so powerfully. I don't even care if it's someone that's not a part of the church. I just want to see God do it. I want to be a part of that. I mean, what an honor would it be for us to be those kind of people? Could you imagine? And what I want to talk about for the next few minutes in this passage are four things that I see that are really important I think we need to take away from the story that I meant for us. Because I think this, this is a passage that shows us that spending time with God is the most missional thing we can do because he will compel us out to others. That he will fill us till we overflow into other people. Here's the first thing I need us to see. Is that, write this down, mission starts with being with God. Just look at the story. Look at the transformation that happens in this woman's life. How did she address Jesus at the beginning? Jew. She's antagonistic to him. She doesn't like him. Then she goes, okay, well, maybe you're a prophet. And then she leaves going, this has got to be the Christ, right? What happened? She just spent time with Jesus. See, here's the reality, guys. When you spend time with God, when you spend time with Jesus, you don't rub off on him. He rubs off on you. So you have buddies, and all of a sudden, you start picking up their mannerisms. They start picking up yours. We, we don't rub off on God at all. He doesn't look at me and go, oh, I need something from Ernie. The way he barely speaks English, I can have some of that. But he looks at us. No, we look at him, and we spend time with him, and all of a sudden, his character starts rubbing off on us. The things he loves starts rubbing off on us. In fact, in Galatians 2.20, it tells us those things are the fruits of the Spirit, that our life begins being filled with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Why? Because those things are central to who God is, and when you become a follower of Christ, and your life is transformed, and he places a new spirit in your heart, and you begin to spend more time with them, guess what? You start picking up on his stuff. What rubs off is him on you. And when we spend time with him, when we have a vibrant relationship with God, that becomes the fuel to mission in our life. It's not a, you see, the vibrant, the reason why we don't see revival in Cincinnati is not because there's a lack of evangelical training or evangelistic training in our city. I mean, we'll have an evangelistic how to share the gospel class every year. We'll have maybe seven, eight people come to it. But I bet you if I pulled, the, just did a poll of this room, have you shared the gospel in the last month, there'd be very few hands that would go up. I'm not judging you. And if I asked you why, I'd get a couple answers. I don't feel adequate. I don't know if it's the right time, right place. I don't feel like I have the right training. I feel like I've messed it up, so I just don't do it. Or I'm afraid if I step into it because I don't think I'd be able to sufficiently. Guys, how much training did this woman have? She had one sit down with Jesus, and then an entire town is brought to faith. Let me tell you why that attitude that you have is a myth and a broken lie. Because it's not about you changing people's hearts, it's about Jesus changing people's hearts. You see what she did? She shared the truth about who Jesus was, and then she brought people to God. She brought people to Jesus. And they let, and she just let Jesus speak for himself. Well, Ernie, Jesus isn't walking around right now. We have his words right here. We got it written down. See, why? That excuse is a terrible excuse because, one, we know. It, the, why it's a terrible excuse is because we know this, that it's not your work that brings somebody to the Lord. It's the Lord's work. You're meant to be a messenger of what he has already done. 
And when we say, I just need better training, I need better this, you are actually laying hold to something that you have to do in the process. Guys, one of the first people I led to the Lord in my life was my best friend's girlfriend on Insta, on Insta chat on IM. You guys don't even know what that is anymore, but the old folks, you know what that is. AOL Instant Messenger. And if anybody has read anything that I have written without it being edited, it is almost impossible. There is so much grammatical error there. It's like, how did you get a master's? A lot of editing. Now imagine that when I'm in the sixth grade doing this, no, seventh grade doing this, and I don't know how to use punctuation correctly, so I just say I don't believe in it right with no punctuation. I went back and read through the message strain between me and her, and I have no idea how she found the gospel in that conversation. Well, now I know. This is not about my ability, strengths, or gifts. It's about his and what he can do through me and my weakness and brokenness. See, God uses the biggest outcasts of that town to have the biggest effect on that town. What might he do through you where you live, work, and play? What might he do through you? Now, here's the thing that we have to continue to look at. It's not about, okay, I heard this message, now I have to go do these things. This isn't an obligation. It's meant to be an overflow. How did she leave? She didn't leave because, all right, well, I got to pay God back for this. She left filled with joy in her heart and mind because she had been redeemed, because she had been found, she had been given value by the king of the universe. My friends, why we don't go to our neighbors where we live, work, and play is because we don't understand how loved and blessed we are by God. We don't understand the transformational work that God has done in our life. And the only way you're going to do that is by drawing near the Lord, and he's going to compel you out. And out of the overflow of your heart, you're going to begin to worship God and share in the gospel with other people. Because the things we delight in, we talk about, right? That's why new parents are always showing pictures of their kids. You know, they're just like, look at it, look at this, I love this, I love this. I mean, I'm guilty of this too. I was, two nights ago, I was looking through all these pictures of me and Jackson. Don't put up the picture yet. All right, putting all the pictures of me and Jackson and just like weeping my eyes out and sending them. Like I sent like 20 pictures to my wife who's in the other room. We're texting one another from another room in our house. It's a weird thing. We love a restaurant. I'm like, oh, you gotta go eat here. It's amazing. The reason why we don't share is because the worship of God does not enthrall our hearts. Here's the second thing we have to say. I'm gonna go quickly through these. Mission happens when God's plans interrupt ours. This woman had a plan to go get water, and she left it at the feet of Jesus. Guys, if you want to see evangelism grow in your life, you have to be willing for holy disruptions that happen in your life. Every important conversation, most important conversation, not every, did not come planned on a piece of paper for me or on a schedule, but happened in the midst of life, bumping into a person, and all of a sudden I'm talking to him about Jesus. I can remember a couple weeks ago, we were going out to dinner and, uh, with all, the, all of our elders and some of our staff getting together, and we see this couple, this, these two women fighting at the restaurant, yelling at one another, almost getting into a physical altercation. And then one of the people in our group all of a sudden talking to one of the women, and all of a sudden, I look back 20 minutes later, while we're supposed to be having a conversation herself, and this woman's weeping with one of the girls, and she's sharing her story. And the woman that's part of our group is sharing the gospel with this other woman. But there's this deep hurt and this deep brokenness. And it's a complete interruption to the night. Perhaps we don't see a movement like this because we're unwilling to be interrupted in our plans. I'll become serious about sharing the gospel when I get done with these tests or this class or I achieve this level at work. I'll be serious about the mission of God. I'll respond to the goodness of God. I'll invest in my relationship with God when I get past these things and you're putting off that you should not. And you need to allow a holy interruption to happen in your life. The third one is this. Mission happens when our wills are in line with God's. And it brings a satisfaction that nothing else can give. Notice after the woman is sent off, and the disciples are begging Jesus to eat. 
purging him of something. He says, I have a food. I have things to eat that you don't know about. And he says what it is, to do the will of God. Something that I know is true from personal experience is when you begin to walk along with God, working with him, and you begin to see a little bit of fruit, it lights your hair on fire for nothing else. Like Jesus is looking at his disciples. He's like, how can you even eat in this moment? Do you realize what's about to happen? They're like, they want to get out of town. They want to go minister to the Jews. He's like, we're about to see revival happen in this town. Right now, it's going to happen. We believe it's going to He's like, do you not see it? But when our will is bent towards God, we're going to see fruit. We're going to see God at work. We're going to be able to walk alongside him. We're going to see, that's where mission actually happens. It's not when God gets on our program, but when we get on his. God doesn't want to be a part of your 10 steps to a great life for you. That's too small for him. He wants you to get on his program where he's going to build a kingdom that's going to last for eternity and that you get to be a part of and help build. And when you bend your will to that, you get to be a part of something you never would have saw if you had just followed your plan. If they would have followed the disciples' plan, they would not have seen any of this happen. You have to think, hundreds of people coming to faith. Now, there is a warning in this. This is my last warning, my last point. It's a missional warning. Missions is about faithfulness, not fruitfulness. Look at Jesus' last words in 35 through 38. He essentially says, hey, some sow, and some labor. In fact, he looks at his disciples and said, some have sown for a long time. I'm sorry, some sow and some reap. And he looks at his disciples and said, hey, some have sown for a long time, but they didn't reap, but you're going to reap what you did not sow. You're going to reap what you did not labor. Why is it important for me to say this? Because it is easy for Christians to fall in love with the fruit instead of Jesus. That for many of us, we can look at this and go, I'm not good at this because I'm not seeing a lot of fruit. Being on mission with God is not about seeing fruit, but it's about doing the will of the Father. And whatever position you have to play, you get to play that play and be excited about it. Do you understand what God is doing when he's calling us to share the gospel? He's calling us to go out to other people. He's giving us an opportunity to join in with him what he's already doing. Like a son when he sees his dad work, and now we can pull that picture up. Let me explain this real quick. This is the last thing to say, and I'm going long. That's me 10 years ago. I look pretty buff, right? I look better now, right? I had more hair then. That's my son, my first son. And one of the days I was cutting grass, he grabbed this toy lawnmower and just was going behind me the entire time. He was actually accomplishing nothing. But he wanted to do it. Why? Because he wanted to be with his dad. This is a beautiful picture of us in Christ. That God is on the move and he's working in people's lives and he's inviting you into it. You may not see what you're doing. You may not even feel like you're doing much of anything. The point is not that you would produce something. That's all of God's work. The point is it's an opportunity for you to be with the Father. It's an opportunity for you to abide and walk more intimately and deeply with Christ. You don't just walk intimately and deeply in Christ in your quiet time. You also walk intimately and deeply in Christ when you trust him on mission wherever he's sending you to where you live, work, and play. Any of those areas. The purpose is not fruitfulness. The purpose is faithfulness, and he will bring about a harvest. So whether, Mercy Hill Church, whether we reap or sow, we're going to pray, and we're going to be faithful to whatever God tells us to do. My heart is that every single one of you in a month can say that you have shared the gospel with somebody. That you, have, that you have indwelled such a relationship with God that you can't help but speak of him because he's so good in your life, you want to see it in other people's lives. Let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your mercy, for your grace, for your goodness. 
Thank you for the picture that we see here. Lord, it is just so filled with so much goodness for our life, so much amazing revelation. Lord, I, I pray that we wouldn't just set this aside. Lord, I pray that these men and women, that we would do business with you right now. I pray that we would repent because so much of the lack of worship in our life is because we sinfully see you wrong. And so, Lord, I pray that you would cultivate in our hearts and our minds a love of you that is just like this woman at the well that is overjoyed because she knows her biggest problem is dealt with. And we wouldn't take it for granted. Lord, I confess so many of the time, I get more excited about a sports game than I do about the redemption of my soul and other people around me. That is shameful. So Lord, I repent of that. I want my will to be bent towards yours. I want you to rub off on me. I want to rejoice in doing the will of God. Lord, may it be done here in Cincinnati. May we see so many people come to faith and leave the brokenness of their lives because of it. And Lord, please, can we just be a part of it? I just want to be a footnote. I was just there. I don't want any of the credit. Just bless me by letting me see that. 